Okay, um, listen up. Uh, this is actually lecture eight. Um, this is the third of three lectures on engineering case studies. Um, we're going to uh, get started with the responses from the attendance question last time, but before that, I wanted to note there's a little confusion on homework assignments. Everything's set now, right? It's November 10th. It's the due date for the next homework assignment. You can get the homework assignment um, via the website as always, okay? Um, so with respect to the last about um, engineer A, um, there was a number of responses and, and uh, I want to go over them quickly. Um, so what were the, the engineer's a, his obligations? This was with respect to the case where um, he or she was asked to um, do a new test that would change the rejection rate for um, the chips. So um, he's, he or she said, um, Engineer A has obligations to management and his company, and so it should be um, examined whether lowering quality specs is actually a more cost-effective approach. The company might see a loss of profit and reputation if the products are defective more often, even if they are covered by a warranty. Um, some student answers in this case. Um, engineer A should allow his staff to follow Engineer B's advice to pass more chips through even if they are defective. Um, engineer A can satisfy this by working with the company to release a public announcement. Um, informing the public satisfies the engineer's ethical obligations. Um, to protect the company's image for possibly defective chips, the company could use Nicholas Cage as their spokesman. Um, if, Nick, if Nick Cage gives the announcement, people will be less surprised if the product does not work and therefore the company's image would be protected and the money would be saved. <laughs> uh, there's always surprises, you know. Um, so let's ignore the Nicholas Cage thing. Um, it's funny, but uh, you know, normally actually you would not make a public announcement about such a thing. Um, you wouldn't go outside the organization. Um, you might go to the other company. We talked about that in class before, but this is not a case um, that would normally be used in whistleblowing. Um, next, Engineer A's obligations are give all the facts to his upper management, be part of a company that knowingly produces a quality product. I assume that's a positive. If upper management still disagrees with this pleading, he should reposition himself with another employer that shares more clearly his personal values. In other words, quit. Um, obligation to the public um, to sell useful products that serve the public. So this person's coming down and saying, that, you know, fight it, but if you don't win, um, leave. Next, <coughs> his obligation is to his boss. Okay. Um, worst chips may be bad for business, but won't put people in danger. He should try to change management decision, but should follow what they say. This represents an interesting characteristic. There's various people in life that sort of will listen to the boss, sometimes even blindly, and just go with what they're saying to make sure, for instance, that they protect their own career. Other people are sort of rebels or you know, will fight with the boss and try to improve things, perhaps even going over the boss's head. Um, so there's this delicate balance um, in the, on the job where you know you want some loyalty to your boss, of course, but you don't want, in my view, you don't want too much loyalty, or he or she can tell you to do anything. Okay, so finding that balance, um, I think you'll find it difficult in life. Next, his obligation is to protect himself and the company. He should go above his supervisor to let him know of the situation. It is possible that a supervisor is trying to make himself look better by making it appear that the supervisor has decreased the defect rate. By releasing the defective units, the company may lose sales. So this is a little conflicted. There's the last sentence, um, but on the other hand, there's the first sentence. You know, you sort of got this person saying, there's two things going on here. You gotta protect yourself, maybe follow what the boss is saying. At the same time, not release the defective units because it can hurt um, the company, lose sales, or perhaps he doesn't say it, but, or she doesn't say it, but lose um, good reputation. 
Um, next, I believe engineer A is obligated to at the very least find engineer B's results to be accurate. If it would cost the money less money to deal with these defects in the chips, then that would be okay, so long as the defects in the chip do not endanger the public, which certainly would have to be sure of that. If engineer A concludes that it costs more money to deal with the warranty department or that a defective chip could possibly harm someone, he should go above his direct manager's head to find an alternative solution. Now, this is a, a form of internal whistleblowing that this person is recommending, you know, going over to boss's head. You fight with the boss, fight with the boss, fight with the boss, and then you go over to head. We're gonna be talking about that process of doing that pretty soon in this class, this whole notion of whistleblowing and how you have to be careful because you don't want to, obviously you don't want to hurt your own career, but on the other hand, you've got to do what's right by um, the public or the environment. Okay, so um, that's the end of the student responses. In uh, this lecture, remember our last case, that was a case where the student had uh, the, the had, was planning on accepting a job with a, uh, a company and then took the vacation slash second interview with the second company. That was our last case that we dealt with in this class. Um, so let me move forward um, to just after um, that, which is right here. So, this is a case of confidentiality and conflict of interest and whose property. So this one's a little bit longer case, but um, follow me here. Um, so this is this uh, guy, Derek Evans. He used to work for a small computer firm that specializes in developing software for management tasks. Derek was a primary contributor in designing an innovative software system for customer services. This software system is essentially the lifeblood of the small firm. The small computer firm never asked Derek to sign an agreement that software design during his employment there becomes the property of the company. This happens in small companies. They, they may not have a lawyer on board because they're not a big company. However, his new employer did. So Derek's now working for a much larger computer firm. His job is in the customer service area, similar to what he had done before, and he spends most of his time on the telephone talking with customers having systems problems. This requires him to cross-reference large amounts of information. It now occurs to him that by making a few minor alterations in the innovative software system he helped design at the small computer firm, cross-referencing can be greatly simplified. So on Friday, Derek decides he will come in early the next Monday morning to make the adaptation. However, on Saturday evening, he attends a party with two of his old friends, you and Horace Jones. Not having seen each other for some time, you talk about what you have been doing recently, and Derek mentions his plan to adapt the software system on Monday. Horace asks, isn't that unethical? That system is really the property of your previous employer. But, Derek replies, I'm just trying to make my work more efficient. I'm not selling the system to anyone or anything like that. It's just for my use. And after all, I did help design it. Besides, it's not exactly the same system. I've made a few changes. This leads to discussion among the three of you. What do you think? What do you tell Derek in this situation? Just go for it? Clearly, a few facts. Yes. No, I, I don't read it that way. No, this is a software that was invented, developed by the small firm. Uh, I assume that I assume it's for customer service, so it, it, it that it, it doesn't say that it's sold. So I'm going to assume no, it's not being sold. They're just using it internally to assist with their customer service for the small firm. It is unusual. I agree. I mean, if it's really that great a piece of software, why isn't the small firm um, selling it and protecting their IP? But apparently that's not the case. They just view it as an internal um, piece of software.
That's true. Um, was there a response to him right here? I would say go for it. I mean, it seems like he's not planning on using this for any profit of his own. He's not selling it. Um, he's just using it as a work tool. Um, and he is modifying it from a spectrum purpose. So we're going to have to be careful with that one, whether he's... We're going to revisit one of your statements about whether he's profiting from its use. Well, yeah, he is using it to increase his efficiency, so you could say that he's profiting from it. Yeah. I mean, uh, and the ownership issue, who owns the software? He should really just talk to his previous employer about it. He, he should talk to his previous employer, you're saying. Yeah, I mean, it, it does make some sense. Of course, you know, if, if he does that, the lawyers jump on board and it's dead in the water. He's not going to be able to use it, right? You know, that's the way things usually work. His company would have to buy it. That's what would end up happening. Well, maybe that's okay though, right? They're getting if there's that much benefit coming from this. Uh, anybody else? And, and, and the way this is worded, it's done carefully. This is not Derek's software. First of all, it's clear. It, it, it is. It, I mean, well, it's a little fuzzy. Um, it's largely the property of the previous company because more than one person helped design the software. He helped design the software. Okay? So other people, other individuals have ownership in it, at least. I mean, if you ignore the issue of whether the company owns it because you didn't have to sign the thing, sign anything, at least somebody else partly owns it. That'd be sort of like, let's say you do a senior design project at OSU. You invent a technology on the team of five people. One person takes off, makes millions of dollars on that technology. Does that person owe? That reminds me of Facebook, right? I'm in the movie, etc. So there are fundamental issues of ownership if you make contributions to technology. I mean, and they're complicated because technology often is a, a development is often a team effort. Okay, so people are do some things. Yes. That complicates things a little bit more. Um, in my mind, however, the previous company, whether it's in writing or not, still owns the software because they paid a salary. <coughs> now, how many people uh, signed um, with when you went and did internships and co-ops, non-disclosure agreements and ownership type agreements? Quite a few of you. And, and if you read, <laughs> a lot of people just sign it. But if you read it, it's kind of like, Anything you think or do in your life, no matter what time of day, you know, you dream it at night, whatever, is the property of the company you're working for. That's typically the way those read. Is that what people see? I mean, if you're doing it in your garage at night, whatever, you know, forget it, it's theirs. Okay? All right, let's go on with the story. Dirk installs, he, he decides to go for it. He installs the software on Monday morning. Soon everyone's impressed with his efficiency and they ask about the secret of his success. Derek begins to realize that the software might well have company-wide adaptability. This does not go unnoticed by supervisors either, the superiors either, so he's offered an opportunity to introduce the system in other parts of the company. So clearly, this is advancing his career. Okay, he's, he's gotten a lot of recognition. Now Derek recalls a conversation at the party. He begins to wonder if Horace was right after all. He suggests that his previous employer be contacted and the more extended use of the software system be negotiated with the small firm. His superiors, superiors firmly resist this suggestion. They insist the software system is now the property of the larger firm. Derek balks at the idea of going ahead without talking with the smaller firm. If Derek does not want the new job, his superiors reply, someone else can be invited to do it. In any case, the adaptation will be made. So I assume that the software is transferred to the company, they do regular backups, so the company's got it. He can't just get it back. Okay, it's done. Okay. Um, so now, you know, he, he, you can tell he was conflicted now, back when he made this decision. Now he's, he's worried. Let's go on. Question. So what should he do now? First, yes.
One problem, though, uh, will the small firm know this is happening? I mean, there's only one way that's going to happen, probably, is, well, his buddies he met with at the party, you kind of could tell. But likely it's Derek that would have to tell them. So what do you think? Should Derek go to the small company and say, this is happening? Yes. You think he should? I mean, he puts himself in a pretty uncomfortable position. They'll be like, what do you do? You took our stuff, man. You know, but you say, yes, he should tell them. Anybody else? Okay, next. Um, does Horace have any responsibility to alert the smaller firm? In other words, you know, he sees this going on. I suppose he's another engineer. These are the geeky dudes talking at the party about tech stuff. Let's say that Derek doesn't go back to the smaller firm. Should Horace go back to the smaller firm? I'm curious your opinion. Yeah, it kind of does. This is one of the problems with being an engineer and behaving ethically, ethically is if you see something, you're like, oh, man, I have to do that. It reminds me of dealing with academic misconduct in this class, a recent case I had. Like, oh, are you kidding me? I got to deal with it, which is no small task for me either. Now, I don't make any judgments. University makes judgments, but I got to fill out a bunch of forms and stuff. Um, so... <laughs> You know, sort of the old statement is, with knowledge comes responsibility, unfortunately, sometimes. And uh, it's not necessarily fun for Horace to deal with this either. But he's in a much better position to tell them because he's done nothing wrong. He's doing them nothing but a favor. Okay? Um, well, Horace and you are about equivalent. So, so if, if he's friends with people at the smaller firm, he might want to tell them. You know, in this situation, uh, I, I think it's probably a good idea to do things in person or so that you're not recorded or have email trails. I, I think it's probably a good idea. Um, okay, thank you. Next one, reverse engineering. While working in a large information technology company over the past two summers, I've been involved with the hard disk drive group of the semiconductor division. One of the products that this group designs is the read channel chip. This chip communicates between the computer and the disk. This is a very competitive area in the semiconductor business because the demand for computer performance has increased and continues to increase exponentially over the past decade. One common practice that I have heard discussed more than once is to use reverse engineering to see what the competitors are doing. This involves taking a microchip pic microscopic picture of the chip as it's laid out in silicon and try to work backwards to the transistor and system levels. The accuracy and amount of information that can be used varies, but it's certainly possible to, possible to obtain system level designs. Is reverse engineering of this sort ethical? It may not be, be as much fun for the engineers, just to take other people's innovations and steal, take it. Is it stealing them? You bought it. You own it? Yes. End user license agreement. You didn't buy the whole line. You bought one copy. Uh, you, end user agreements are often for software. It doesn't apply in the real world? Well, it may apply, but usually when I go to Target or whatever and buy something, I don't sign anything that says, I've agreed to an end user, such an agreement like that. Well, there's that page in the back of the book before the title page that says this is still our book. You have one copy. Well, it depends on what you're talking about again. If you're talking about books, it may be the case in publishing. But there's many technologies that are sold on the market where you're not signing a thing. I don't disagree with what your point is. In fact, you could sort of say, by extension, since there's an agreement like that, it's like you said the first time, it's, you, you're buying one product, you're not buying a line of products. I mean, that's, that's a very reasonable statement. And that's why reverse engineering may not be okay. Do I got somebody in the back? Well, it says that they're reverse engineering just to see what their competition is doing, not like a blatant copying of the technology. Well, I mean, it's not like they're copying the technology. It's just 
So you, you, I guess your point is, is that it's, it, you would, or let me try to paraphrase. Are you saying that it sort of depends on the extent to which to, they use the information? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they can be very different cases depending on how the information is used. Was there another comment up here? You know, um, years ago I vi visited uh, Delco Chassis Division of General Motors um, in the Dayton area and uh, walk in, the first thing I saw was um, a, a, a brake stand, testing brakes, and right on it said, Toyota brake, blah, 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 from Camry or whatever it was. I'm like, wait a minute, I thought I was, a ch I say, the, you know, they act like nothing's going on. And the, the, the employees there, I asked them, I was like, what is going on here? And they say, we, everybody in the industry does this. We're all figuring out what each other are doing. We're the first people to buy a Toyota car when it comes off the line. We figure out what they've done, and we use each other's ideas. Okay? Wow! Um, so if, it, if, if everybody else is doing it, is it okay then? Uh, that sounds morally wrong. It's like... You know, if everybody is running around committing murder, is it okay to me to commit murder? But it's a standard in industry. I mean, it, it's, uh, and, and you know, in this case, it's rather interesting because, of course, brakes are a crucial safety item on a vehicle. So in a certain sense, from the public's perspective, you sort of want that going on, right? Ford makes a great advance, you want GM to know about it and Toyota to know about it. Yeah, that, that, that's another thing with extent, like you brought up before. Yeah, so that's like where you get like the patent issue, where like, another company looks and goes, that's not just our ideas, that's exactly what we did. Yeah. Then you're going to be able to. In the blue right here, did yeah, you? I think the whole point is that it's always fine to reverse engineer, but just if it would be patent infringement, don't infringe the patent. Yeah. Stick with the law. Yes, up here. I mean, some of these, like there are companies um, and bad houses, like in China, that will just take a design from another company and just outright copy it exactly. Yeah. And sell it a lot cheaper. Um, yeah. And that, I mean, there's well, really that. yeah, this is this is happening internationally a lot. Um, I, I I wrote a book a number of years ago and it showed up on the Chinese market under a different publisher and. Yeah. It's selling for, you know, it's, it's, the quality of the paper was lower and uh, so forth, but it, it, um, it was selling for much cheaper. And of course that infringed on copyright, but what are you going to do? I mean, I, I, I'm not going to fight it. I mean, that's, that's my publishing company's problem. I don't even own, own the thing once I give it to them anyway. Okay, so yeah, there's all kinds of infringements going on around the world, partly because it's very difficult to enforce Lost. And because, you know, if you think about it, technologies have flowed around the world in many ways over history, right? I mean, the U.S., you know, people think of the U.S. as like this great originator, but no. We, we also, it, that's true. U.S. is today a great originator of technology. However, historically, we borrowed a lot from other places. Historically, a lot of stuff came out of China to Europe. Historically, for instance, um, historically, the U.S., um, uh, when the Industrial Revolution was starting in, in uh, England, got a lot of technology from England. So there's been a lot of transfer of technology over time. Okay, any other comments? Next, NSP e-case. Engineer A again. 
works as an employee for QRS Engineering on a full-time basis. Engineer A also has his own separate engineering practice in which he performs services that are also performed by QS, QRS Engineering. Engineer A's work, including all client contacts, is done completely on his own time, evenings and weekends, using his own equipment and materials. Engineer A does not attempt to lure existing QRS engineering clients to his engineering practice. The QRS Engineering Employee Handbook has no specific policy that addresses performing work outside, I'm sorry, addresses performing outside work, and Engineer A does not advise the firm of his outside practice. So, first thing, I mean, seems that Engineer A is a little worried about this, uh, what you call a conflict of interest, right? I mean, how can you work for a company and want it to succeed, and you work for a different company, your own company, and want it to succeed, and they're competitors? Fundamentally, there's a conflict of interest. Is he really going to work hard for the competitor? Who's really his firm? It's a very odd situation to get into, right? So, question, should this engineer A request a clarification of policy? Yes? Uh, so there could be intellectual property issues that arise if he, for instance, invents or does something that's really profitable and gets notice in his own company, he, he could get um, the other company coming back to him and saying, no, that's ours. So, so having a clear policy really is important in this situation, yes. Other comments? Yes. Um, is it possible that there could be, I don't know, is there a business term for an act of non-aggression between the two firms because... They might have different client pools and the smaller firm can only be working with smaller clients. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it doesn't talk about that issue. Uh, it doesn't bring up the issue whether the clients, whether they're really, they're a acting as though here that they're not competing for clients. They could be clients that QRS would not take because they were too That's small. Right. So we, we would have to assume that from the way this is stated. So if but if they were competing, then things get really dicey. They're not competing for Other comments? Okay, um, next. Engineer A, a young professional engineer with expertise in software engineering, works for a hospital information technology department. Think OSU Med Center. He's assigned to, to work with the people in the intensive care unit, the computer user group headed by the lead, lead physician in the ICU, is forced to facilitate interface between a piece of commercial data processing <coughs> software and various units in the ICU, including real-time patient monitoring devices. From the manager on down, the computer user group is not technically up to the mark in experience or in education. The computer user group was falling significantly behind schedule. Engineer A learns that the group is seriously considering cutting back on testing in order to close the schedule gap. Upon this idea, Engineer A argues strongly against it with the computer user group. In this case, Engineer A's arguments has some effect but Engineer A is nevertheless given the clear impression that his long-term employment prospects with this organization are now significantly impaired. Apparently, a part of the problem had to do with the reluctance on the part of hospital administration to class with the physician who heads the computer user group. Engineer A feels that the basic problem is incompetence of the computer user group, and he does not see how he could be effective on his own and combative. Ugh, sticky situation, right? You have an authority. I mean, in a hospital, doctors rule. I don't care. Engineers are peons. Okay? Computer scientists, peons. Okay? Doctor says, um, you know, this is going forward. It's going forward. Okay? But you have technical competence to see a problem. You got, a, you got an incompetent group working on the doctor, and you're trying to fight the situation. What in the world can you do? Yes? I think you should first start looking for new employment. <laughs> yeah. And secondly, I mean, this is a, an intensive care unit. You know, people's lives are online and they're skipping, skipping uh, on tests on computing software and whatnot. I would probably inform the media. You may. The, the question of whether to inform the media is a complex one, though, because um, 
It's not saying here, it's, it's not clear because it's such a brief statement. Is this person, engineer A, going to the physician? It's pretty hard to walk into the group of computer people and say, you guys are competent. You can't do that. You know, you get, so it sounds like this engineer A needed to go up to the doctor. And I'll, he goes to the doctor, and the doctor says, no, I trust my group. And you, and you argue, 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 and don't get anywhere. Yeah, you might want to go public on something like this. But the decision of whether to go public or not, you go public and uh, there's a lot of questions. Before you would go public, you'd have to ask whether you go over to the doctor's head. Because, of course, there's hospital administrators that are above right. her, I mean, her they head. Hire I mean, the, you know, that person who was in charge of the ICU, that shows a little incompetence on that, on that physician's part. Yeah. Oh, well, yeah, for sure. But there's a lot of people who are on these higher levels that are technically incompetent. Technically. Yes, you know? Don't respect complexity of software or other technologies, <laughs> electrical technologies, for instance. Don't understand them, just use them. Don't understand the development of them. The role of testing um, and how it's difficult to know how much to test, etc. And a lot of uh, very smart people don't understand things like that. I find that all the time in my job as an engineer. Uh, people don't know what we do. They don't know how we do it. They don't know why we do it. They just love the iPhone in their pocket or the Android in their pocket, right? And so um, same thing in this situation. You have a physician, loves the real-time monitoring technology, EKG, EEG, blah, blah, blah. But you know, he or she doesn't know how to make it, you know, make sure it's working reliably, you know? So engineers are supposed to be able to advise it, and they should insist. An engineer often has to insist on, you know, claim their expertise, right? Say, no, I know what I'm talking about here. This is, you have to understand this. This is incredibly complex, right? Um, some of the, the complexities of some technologies start to approach those of biological systems like pieces of the human body. I mean, the, the technologies are not easy to understand. And a lot of people don't think deeply about that fact. Any other comments? Yes? You could also talk a little bit about maybe a training for the user group to understand the system better. That yeah. will increase, like, that will reduce the schedule gap. So. OK, so talk to him. She said that you might want to talk to the physician about running a training program. You might want to talk to the physician about sending these people back and getting a degree. No, like, especially only about uh, how to use it and maybe the basics of it. Yeah, very, yes. Okay, thank you. Um, next, engineer A worked for the U.S. government in a defense agency for many years as an engineer, raising to a fairly high managerial position in the government. Upon retirement, engineer A accepts an executive position with Supercom, a company producing electronic equipment for the military. Shortly after coming on board with Supercom, engineer A is informed by a manager in another Supercom division that under an existing contract with the Department of Defense, a key test on an important product was not being performed in the manner specified by the contract. According to the employee, this practice had been going on for several years, and the subordinate felt very uncomfortable about it. Engineer A, who had considerable expertise with the testing technology involved, looked into the matter more carefully. Engineer A found that the shorter but significantly less costly test had indeed been substituted by the company for one under the contract. But after some review and study, Engineer A concludes that Supercom's test was actually as effective as the specified test. Nevertheless, Engineer takes his findings to Supercom's upper management, executive management team and recommends the company apply to the contracting agency for contract change authorizing the simpler test. Following the meeting, Supercom executives decide to continue with this current course of action. Since there were no safety or quality issues involved and wanting to start out on the right foot for Supercom, engineer decided not to pursue the matter further. So was that ethical? So what, to summarize, that's a long statement of the case. But basically what's happened is you're, you're, you're producing a technology, electronic technology for the military. And in the contract, it says it must be tested this way. And that has been agreed upon by um, your company, Supercom, and the government. 
There's a contractual agreement. But the engineers figure out later, well, we can test this in a much simpler fashion, save ourselves a lot of money, okay? And this person with a lot of experience basically says, it's doing as good a job testing. All right, this is just an innovation. The question is, is whether, and so they're saving money, they're making more money then than what originally was agreed upon. So is the company liable to the government to tell them? Another way to state that is, is are they being good stewards of the taxpayer dollar? Yes? It isn't what? Sorry, I keep talking. Uh, I said it's possible that the military is aware of something that would be shown through that testing method, but would not be shown through another testing method. Now, that would be a significant concern, yeah. So if they do that without the military's approval? They get really get in the mess, right? Yeah. Now, now this, this uh, engineer A seems to be saying, uh, at least one person, an expert, says, this is a good test. The question is whether engineer can, A can be trusted. One person's evaluation, okay? And then second of all, does there have to be a new agreement? I mean, that's the end question. Does there have to be a new agreement between the government and the electronic uh, equipment supplier? You're saying yes. For that reason. Yes. To make sure it's doing everything it originally said. Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Yes. I think this more has to do with um, how much weight engineer A's opinion carries at this point. Because he just um, just started with the company, yeah. <laughs> um, but I think that he actually does have more of a say in it, right? Because he did work for like a huge um, defense firm prior to this. So right. And he carries more of an expert opinion on this. So different answers. I mean, the person in the back is basically saying this engineer A shouldn't to tolerate this and just ignore this. Should do something with, with the government and make sure everything's okay. Communicate. And generally that is a good idea because um, you never know how that communication went on in the past about how this test, the negotiations are over how this test should go and what it's supposed to catch. And the question is, is, is back then when it was done, was it, is this test catching everything that was supposed to be caught? Maybe some things that may not have been documented, for instance. Okay, next one. This engineer A gets around. So um, a software engineer this time serves a, as a consultant to credit data, a credit records clearinghouse, and is asked to evaluate a software problem with their 5 million individual credit files. The original software was designed by another software company which is no longer under contract with credit data. The problem, an apparent software design flaw, relates to the fact that the database software sometimes misidentifies individuals located in the credit files. Recently, several situations were uncovered involving home purchasers with high credit score who were in the process of seeking a home loan. However, credit check through credit data indicated that the applicant was a poor credit risk and the loan was denied. The problem was later corrected and the proper applicant credit information is forwarded to the lender, but in many cases, the purchasers lost the opportunity to purchase a home. In other cases, applicants with low credit scores were misidentified as individuals with high credit scores, and as a result, loans, and in some cases, low interest loans, were offered, which later resulted in loan defaults. Up to this point, no information has been released to the public or to governmental regulators. Engineer A is asked to make a recommendation concerning the credit data software problem. What are uh, his or her um, ethical responsibilities about the software? I mean, this is the kind of situation that applies to a number of things that we do as engineers. You're going to go work in an industry. You're going to have a product that's going to be a little dicey, maybe faulty even at times. And the question is, is what do you do? Anyone? Yes? Quit the company before it goes under. Do what to the company? Quit before it goes under. Quit, quit the company before it goes under. 
Yeah, that might be a response. Right now, when the economy is pretty good and you're, you're all getting multiple job offers, but uh, other times, you got to stick with your company. You may be in a city, for instance, that doesn't have any other company. You've got a family there. You don't want to move. Let's say you're going to stick with the company. What should you do? I mean, this is not a case to go whistleblow, probably. Okay. It is a case where you want to make sure your customers are treated fairly, ultimately. Did you have a? Yeah, it doesn't sound like it's that big of a deal. I mean, these people that have the low, or the low credit scores getting the loans, I mean, that's not really a huge deal. Except for obviously, the investors are the ones giving them loans. Um, I mean, here, I would just say engineer A tries to, tries to fix the software issue. I don't think there's really any, any reason to raise a flag at all. I mean, these people with high credit scores, if they're really looking for a loan, they can just go to somebody else and tell them, hey, look at my high credit score. Right. But you are saying that uh, he or she has some responsibility to try to fix the problem or themselves or to make sure that somebody else fixes the problem. Or somebody else will fix the problem and become the new engineer. Yeah. Yes. This statement said that there were five million records. How many instances of this problem were logged? Well, that's, they haven't stated that. Was it, I don't know, three of each kind of problem, or was it 300 of each kind of problem? Doesn't say. And it matters, right? I mean, right? It matters a lot. So, yeah, we can't tell from this case. Okay. Um, Next. Um, engineer A is a software systems engineer hired by a new soft startup company to help in the development of a new software product. Engineer A soon learns, <coughs> excuse me, engineer A soon learns that the plans for the new, the proposed new product will be based upon proprietary software for which new soft does not have a license. Engineer A assumes that this is some sort of mistake and speaks to the company president about the matter. Engineer A is assured by the company president that the situation will be rectified. The several months pass and no license has been secured for proprietary software. The repeated efforts by Engineer A to get the new soft leadership to address the issue have failed. Engineer A is uncertain of what steps she should take next. What? Yes? That's a form of whistleblowing. The answer is yes, she could, and it may make sense. Um, engineer A has been to the president, all the way to the top. So it, it, it may be warranted, a, a step that's warranted at this point. If he just complained, or she just complained to her immediate boss, who got no action, that may not be enough to justify going outside the organization. But uh, um, since, she, She's been to the president. Um, yeah, it might make a lot of sense to go to whoever, you know, um, owns the proprietary software. This kind of theft happens. Um, I had a, one of my first PhD students is a patent lawyer, um, and uh, two of the biggest soft uh, companies, EE type companies, you can think of are in a dispute of one against the other, and. Uh, he showed, he got into the low level code that they had produced and showed that one company took the other company's code. Yeah, this stuff is happening. It's, it's happening by reputable companies. Okay? Um, next, Engineer A, a CEO of a small engineering corporation, teams up with another small engineering firm in the development and delivery of a highway rail intersection database management systems for various public and private enterprises. Engineer A is the co-author and the program is patented and copyrighted. Engineer B, in a private firm from State X, calls Engineer A and informs Engineer A that State X's Department of Transportation is interested in the highway rail system and is asking Engineer B to evaluate the system. Engineer B requests and Engineer A agrees to visit Engineer B in State X. Prior to the visit, Engineer B requests that Engineer A Prepare a project proposal in which, which Engineer A submits. Later, at Engineer B's request, Engineer A visits Engineer B's office, offices, and demonstrates the system. Project managers as well as programmers from Engineer B's firm were present at the meeting. 
Engineer A describes in great detail the technical specs of the system. Following the meeting, Engineer B requests that Engineer A prepare a new proposal with detailed breakdown of all costs. Following the passage of time, Engineer A receives a phone call from a subordinate of Engineer B advising that Engineer B will not need Engineer A's firm's service services because Engineer B's firm now has to completely design their own system. So what you've got is a situation where one engineer does all this work, trying to get them up the, the contract, goes and tells them how they're going to do it and everything, and they're all listening, and they say, well, we'll do that ourselves, because we learned from you. Very difficult situation to be in. I've been in that situation. It's very uncomfortable. I mean, you, you, you know, people have a pretty good sense of when people are stealing things from them, right? I mean, in this situation, it looks really bad. I mean, you know, this person is probably being mistreated. So, you know, you got to be careful in these kind of situations, too, to protect yourself, not get things stolen from you. And you don't want to be part of the team that's stealing from someone else, right? It just wouldn't be right. So um, I think this case is actually rather clear, but I also think it's quite relevant um, to many cases that you'll um, encounter um, especially if you work for a consulting firm, okay, or some other type of um, service firm. Next, Engco, an engineering firm, distributes a brochure of that along with the usual information contains a listing of key personnel. Some are licensed professional engineers and others are not. In some instances, key personnel who do not hold an engineering degree and who may in fact be high school graduates only are given such titles in the brochure as engineer, design engineer, etc. This practice is rain is arisen from federal agency engineering contracts that refer to inspection personnel as engineers. Engco is concerned the company brochure may be conveying a misrepresentation and find that there are more engineers on its staff than is the true situation. What <laughs> so no, is this ethical? Well, this is a, this this stuff happens. I mean, it, because you call somebody, you know, is the engineer that guy with the funny looking hat that drives the train? I mean, engineer is used for other terms. Engineer is is just someone who sort of builds things, engineers things, right? Makes things. Do you need a degree to be called an engineer? Wasn't this on the homework? <laughs> Do you want to respond? Yeah. Yes. Um, I guess you can somehow maybe discern with maybe like an asterisk next to the people with like an ex explanation at the bottom of the brochure that although they hold it, hold the position, they might not have the schooling. Even though they probably do have the experience if they're working with a successful company. Yeah, so you're saying clarify. Yeah. Yes. Uh, I don't think there's an ethical issue. Uh, I think it's their company, and if they decide that this person that works for me, like they are our engineers, they can call them whatever they want. I think I don't think you need a degree at all to be an engineer. Oh, this is a tough issue. I'm not, yes, I've actually heard people with a lot of networking experience being called network engineers. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it is thrown around easily, but if you're a medical doctor and you call yourself and you're not don't have any education in that area, you just happen to you know fix your brother's uh, uh, cut or something. Uh, you can you call PhD. yourself a doctor? You could be a PhD doctor, but I can see. Yes. Well, my question is, do you actually have to have a degree in any source to take your ME exam? To take your what? Oh, the EIT and then the PE exam? I believe you do, yeah. You don't have to go to law school to pass the bar. <laughs> yeah, but it, uh, I believe that as an engineer, you can't, without a degree train in education, take the EIT and PE. Yeah, you need to graduate from an embedded accredited university. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, and it's just like um, with, uh, you know, 
to be a, licensed as a medical doctor, I, I'm sure you have to have a degree. It's just that we, we throw, we're, we're in, in the hierarchy of professionals, we're kind of in a position where this term is still thrown around. I, I think that eventually it will be not thrown around as much um, as, as a professional. Do you have a comment? Yeah, I was just going to say there's, there's you know, a, a big difference between someone as a licensed professional engineer and someone who is an engineer. You know, like a, an engineer, the title of engineer is not legally, you know, protected, but a licensed professional engineer is a legally protected. So like in the case with a medical doctor, uh, you know, that's a, that is a protected title by law. Yeah, you know, by license. license. So as long as this company isn't saying, here's a list of all of our licensed professional engineers. The problem though is with the company, let me just play devil's advocate, all right? The problem with the company is they may be misrepresenting the amount of expertise because they know how a lot of people will take it. That's the difficulty because it can be a misrepresentation, which makes it sticky. Yes? I remember reading an article in The Onion, the satirical newspaper, six months ago about a, about a firm that was laying off full-time employees due to budget reasons and hiring more interns as junior engineers. Yeah? To fill up the workforce. <laughs> OK. Uh, we're stopping here. And uh, the attendance question is this. All right, this is it. This attendance question is a change in subject from the cases. All right? So, uh, and this is the subject we're going to discuss next class period. We'll start out with your responses to this question. For those of you who have had a job in engineering industry, rate on a scale of one to ten, the overall level of professionalism at your workplace, combine persons with environment. Okay, you know what professionalism now is. It's technical competence and behavior, basically. Competence and conduct, all right? So just give one number. Um, Veronica will average every, all the numbers and give me one number. This will start our discussion on professionalism in the workplace. 